All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Apocalypsis Historia. Now, for the first time ever, face reveal, we got uh, myself, Brady, and... And there's a chance over here. Your uh, main Shakespearean uh, doubter. Your main uh, uh, disintegrationist. Yeah. So uh, The usual suspect. Yeah. Let's do some attribution studies. And so, uh, yeah, today we'll be talking about, once again, another one of these artifacts, right? Just like the last episode for Henslow that we just did. But uh, real quick, we're going to do a book check. So, yeah, on the spot. Uh, what book are you currently reading right now? Um, let's see. I tried to start reading uh, John Williams Augustus. Um, John Williams is kind of one of these super underrated unsung authors that sort of become super popular with the uh, New York uh, Review Books publication. So any of you guys ever seen those NYRB books that some people hate the covers, some people love the covers. Me and Brady are in the uh, love the covers side, so uh, sorry, sorry if you guys don't like the NYRB, but that, that turned us on to awesome books like Warlock and... Uh, um, uh, Currently, the long ships. The long ships. Um, I, I got. I got so many. I can't think. Oh, the land breakers. I, I mentioned in the last video. I think. Oh, that was the um, But yeah, um, one of the other ones that I really love is Butcher's Crossing, which is a western. It's technically a western. It's it's more like a 19th century version of the book Deliverance. Um, but that's by John Williams, and so I was like, dude, let me pick up Augustus. That won the National Book Award. Uh, but I haven't had any darn time to read that. Um, right before that, I was reading me some uh, Billy Bathgate by E.L. Doctorow, and I've tried to read that several times, and uh, this time I just realized you have to get used to the syntax that Billy's using. Some people don't like it because it's really, uh, you know, high-level vocab and high-level syntax, and it's <coughs> supposed to be a teenage kid that's, uh, you know, growing up in... Tw oh, all right, guys, sorry, I get my... 150 pound dog in here. All right. Uh, so Butcher's Crossing, it was great. Uh, tried uh, uh, Augustus, uh, haven't gotten to get into it, but I was reading Billy Bathgate. Uh, the syntax is tough, but uh, once you get past that, it's actually pretty awesome. And you can get past it because you realize that this isn't 13 year old or 15 year old Billy talking. This is a much older Billy looking back on that and kind of being in the spot moment and trying to retell his uh, sort of youth or childhood. And uh, Super awesome opening scene. I uh, won't spoil it too much, but the main... Uh, Billy's the main character, but uh, his boss is this super awesome gangster. Not, maybe not awesome, but super powerful gangster. And he's about to kill his uh, number one guy, who's always been his best friend, and goes from there. So, uh, yeah, check that one out. What about you, and, Brady? What, what are you reading? Uh, well, I won't go into the books. Maybe I'm currently reading, because I meant to drop these last time. But I just did... I just finished another New York review book. And it's called uh, To Each His Own by Leonardo Schiazia. Okay. Uh, it's an Italian book set in uh, Palermo, Palermo, it uh, Italy. And okay. it's sort of like, uh, it's it's basically like, yeah, a, like a pulp crime fiction uh, mafia story. But you're like in this guy who's much like us. He's trying to sleuth out all these clues. And let's just say he sort of ends up in trouble in the end but it's a really short book it was like 155 pages okay, or something so yeah a really quick book but i also just finished gene wolf's um the wizard knight and he's more known for his sci-fi super long epic the the yeah. book of the new sun or the book of the new earth i forget their names i haven't read uh, all of those and uh but yeah this one is very much in the edmund spencer kind of philip sydney vibe where you got this sort of like you know elf freeze people and this kid's transported to this arthurian sort of like half arthurian knight okay. half uh like norse mythology mashup or whatever okay and so yeah just a lot of really cool stuff and it right on, right on. same thing it's still maybe uh it's not going to be your sort of uh uh, what you got it. It's not it's not quite who's the guy who that's not like a Brandon Sanderson type of book where you know It's you know hard finding these sort of uh, the, the superpower high fantasy trope. It's a lot more I don't know. It's a lot more laid-back you kind of get a lot of med medieval society sort of uh, uh, Tidbits and whatnot, but yeah, really thoroughly enjoyed it Right on right on um, Yeah, you guys if you got some books y'all been reading uh Last time we wrecked some books, uh, some uh, commoners shouted out some books of their own. So if, if you got some books you want to wreck to us, please shout it out. Because um, yeah, at some point it's not just about Shakespeare. That's kind of our pitch. There's a bunch of other guys other than Shakespeare. And there's other times other than the Renaissance. So um, yeah, we love reading. We love literature. Um, hopefully you guys do too. And uh, 
let's go ahead and get started with uh, the uh, main event here. So last time we came at you with an artifact, um, really cool document, the Henslow Diary, um, this really like first-hand account of the era, and it's a really rare thing to find that diary and find those details. Uh, similarly, this play is a super rare play. We actually have it in manuscript form. Uh, there's sort of contention, and you know, this isn't fringe SAQ stuff, this is mainstream stuff. There's contention in the mainstream as to whether these are fair papers, meaning that they're um, the ones used for print, or whether it's foul papers, the ones that are used and uh, transcripted, and the ones that are transcripted, this is the old one that's kind of tossed being the foul papers, or whether this is just any old kind of draft or transcript and hadn't even made it to the printers or anything like that. Um, that's all up for argument. Some people want to say that it went as far as um, making it to the stage and that it got staged and we maybe don't have the most updated version. A lot of people have said, no, no way it made it to the stage. This isn't good enough. And uh, how, how could it keep going? And a lot of people have speculated, maybe this is censored. Maybe this was supposed to get played and it touched on too many uh, sort of heartstrings and it's like, all right, no, we got to censor this. Um, and all those details will play into when you think this play was from, because even though we have the manuscript, uh, they didn't like, you know, like we do in like elementary school, put your name and date at the top. They didn't do that. So we don't have a date at the top. And so this thing could be as early as the early 1590s. It could be as late as 1600, 1601, maybe 1602, maybe even 1603. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that people have tried to make readings to parse that out. Um, and once again, like, when you think it is may tell you who you think is writing it. And so uh, we'll get into that in just one second. Um, but this is sort of a modern artifact in that, like, it wasn't always known. This hasn't been always known and talked about since Shakespeare's time. Uh, okay, my bad, guys. We are back. Had a little technical difficulty, but... Um, I want to take us through, not the entire play of Sir Thomas More, but I want to take us through what the arguments are for who wrote this play. And um, you'd be surprised. Um, it's not just one person. Uh, because the actual manuscript itself, we have several, several handwritings. And so, because of that, we actually have... Not one, not two, not three, not four, but six authors, okay? And we talked about this in our last video with the Henslow Diary, that collaboration is totally the norm. Uh, you have several writers at a time, upwards of five, six, maybe seven playwrights to a play. Um, not always. It can be as few as one or two, but more often than not, it's at least two, three, four, five. Um, and this one, it's a lot of people. And... You know, we also saw in the Henslow Diary that maybe it's not five people at a time, but we have two people working on it, an early version, and then later two other guys are hired to revise it. And so, um, let's presume that uh, Dr. Faustus is written by Thomas Nash and Christopher Marlowe, which I think it's probably actually a better, more accurate way of saying that would probably be Thomas Decker and Henry Chettle. But let's, say, let's call them Nash and Marlowe for now. Um, you know, Nash and Marlowe, that's two dudes, and then we see Bird and Rally making additions to it. That's four guys. Okay. Um, so here it could be the same thing, that we have, you know, a few hands writing the original version, then maybe it gets pulled out later, and then maybe even on top of that it needs some extra pizzazz or edits. Okay. So who is writing it? Well, we have Hand S right here, Anthony Monday. This is the main writer. This is what they call the original manuscript. And remember, Monday is in Mira is called our great plotter, or the best plotter. Um, and uh, I wonder if I'm supposed to read Francis Mirrors like I'm supposed to read Ben Johnson, ironically, because um, I've yet to see an, a Monday play where it's like, oh, he's the best plotter. I mentioned in the last one that, you know, he gets named and stuff like Julius Caesar. You know, that has, so good, that has a good plot. Just like, uh, isn't it also the same thing where they call Industrious Kid and Kid has like one or two plays or something? Right. A sporting Kid and Industrious Kid, and it's like, uh, what three? What, how many plays do we actually attribute to Kid? And you know, people like Brian Vickers are like, no, it's because we have like dozens of plays that 
need better attribution and are totally kids, and we haven't called it kids, but, like, maybe on the other hand, it's a wry ironic comment. I don't know. Um, that said, Monday is the writer of the original script, but then we get the emendations, which suggests that this is a Henslow play. It's got many hands. Um, it's got handwritings to people that we've all attributed to Henslow, other than Shakespeare here, but... Haywood and Chettle we saw all over Henslow. Decker, of course. He's like the main writer other than maybe Chettle. Um, Monday's all over uh, Henslow. So this looks like a Henslow play. That seems like a very, you know, um, legitimate, uh, reasonable thing to say. So the only ones that are really not labeled here, and here, let me go through first. There's Hand A. He writes several parts, and they've identified it as Chettle through handwriting and stylistic reasons um same with thomas haywood um who writes all the clown parts and as i told you in the last video if you're reading shakespeare and you're reading the clown section i think brady thinks you're reading probably thomas haywood maybe thomas haywood somebody else editing thomas haywood later like ben johnson or something maybe it is just thomas haywood maybe thomas haywood's rewriting some earlier guy um but it's probably thomas haywood you're reading um Hand C, a professional scribe who copied a large section of play. I don't really care for this attribution. Um, what makes them know that it's a scribe and not something else? Well, they tell you, oh, this matched handwriting that we saw in another play that we know is a scribe. And then you go and you look up how they know that one's a scribe. And they say, oh, we didn't see this handwriting anywhere else. And it's like, okay, cool. Meanwhile, we have dozens of playwrights that we don't have handwriting of. And it's like, maybe it's them. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe. And if you read, uh, I believe it's Greg does, uh, Walter Greg does the original uh, sort of print of this Sir Thomas More, and he'll tell you, um, and I could have Greg wrong, but he'll tell you, like, dude, Hansi's making edits and stuff. And so if he is a professional scribe, there's somebody standing over his shoulder saying, e -e edit that out, edit that out. Or else this is like maybe just the ballerist, uh, you know, most top dog. Uh, loose cannon uh, sort of scribe you've ever seen. He's just, no, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit out Shakespeare. I'm going to put my own stuff in. Like, okay, that's gutsy. Uh, so I don't much care for this attribution. There's probably a better name out of Henslow's diary that we could put there, but who knows. Um, and then there's a few people that say, like, Hand D and Hand C could be the same handwriting, just this was done like a year earlier or something, or months earlier, or with a different pen, so that the handwriting subtly changed, because... You'll notice hand E, hand C, and hand D are all somewhat similar. They're pretty similar. Uh, and hand A even can kind of look the same sometimes. But it seems distinct enough, both stylistic and uh, handwriting. And uh, They try to use spelling, too. Um, spelling's not always helpful, as we saw with Henslow's Diary. Uh, and then, of course, we get to hand D. They so, so proudly put, oh, William Shakespeare in here. But we'll, we're going to dis you know, dispel that in a second. Um, and so, last but not least, we get Thomas Decker, and it's clearly Decker, um, both through handwriting and stylistic reasons. And so, once again, these are all Henslow Diary guys, except William Shakespeare. What the heck's going on? And so, because of that, uh, the mainstream consensus is that this is definitely an early play. Um, this is definitely probably when Lord Strange's men is doing their thing still with Henslow, and Shakespeare's still with Henslow, writing things like Henry VI and Titus. Um, but there is compelling argument, especially by Carol Chillington, and any Stratfordians out there that are, oh, I'm going to, she's been rebutted. Please tell me what was so convincing about that rebuttal. I've read all the rebuttals. They're not very convincing. They pretty much sidestep her argument, and they try and say, no, your premise is wrong from the start. But uh, that's not a really convincing rebuttal. And that's just them saying, sticking to their guns saying, no, what we said is already true and I'm not listening to you. Uh, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong, please, in the comments. Um, so let's, let's get to Carol Chillington. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Okay. Playwrights at work. Henslow, not Shakespeare's. Okay. And so she goes in and she's talking about what we say about it, where it comes from. And she, um, Okay, and she says, look, we've looked at it for a lot of ways, especially under the sort of magnifying glass of trying to find hand D, but we've yet to sort of actually look at this and cross-section it with Henslow 
to try and get an accurate portrayal of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis at the sort of company business level. And that, that you would think that's something they would totally do to understand this world that they act like they so love. Um, so she actually does that, and she does a fantastic job. And what she sort of figures out um, is that there's probably a name that we can put in there instead of William Shakespeare. And uh, what she also is able to figure out is that, look, we can actually use the Henslow Diary to figure some of this stuff out. Um, so, let's see. Um, she says, but Sir Thomas More is yet to be examined in these ways. And she says, previous, um, it presents a unique artifact for studying the mechanics of Elizabethan playwriting. So we can actually try and get into the process of how these writers, like, you know, if we got a behind-the-scenes look into South Park or True Detective or uh, Squid Games or uh, Chernobyl or, you know, some, some really well-written big-time show that has a following, you get to look inside the behind-the-scenes in HBO, and HBO sometimes does that. You get to look into their writer's room, and you get to see how they're actually doing. You see the guys pitch the ideas, and it's a collaborative effort. That's what this is giving us. That's what Carol Chillington has given us here. And uh, that shouldn't be just, meh. Oh, she's saying Shakespeare's not Shakespeare. Oh, get her out of here. She's not a Shakespeare authorship doubter. She's just a Shakespearean scholar, a Renaissance-era scholar, that's trying to better accurately identify Hand D and at the same time cross-examine this with other documents like the Henslow's, Henslow Diary to understand the writing process of any of these people. Not just Shakespeare, but Decker, uh, Chettle, um, any Henslow playwright. Okay, so we can go further. Um, she says, attention has been focused on the controversial business of attaching names to the hands Greg identified in the manuscript only as the letters that we now identify as the song that wiki page. Um, the scribe Greg called him since he was the playwright who produced the fair copy of the play manuscript is Anthony Monday. Um, let's see. His writing appears elsewhere in two stage plots performed by Lord Strange's men and the Admiral's company when they are resident there. Handy is the mystery then. And Simpson, relying on an impression he had, fired the debate by declaring that part of the manuscript was Shakespeare's. And in his own hand. So, in Shakespeare's own hand. So, um, that was just some guy saying, oh, what if? That, that wasn't a guy saying, I've got the answer because I've done a bunch of evidence. That was just some guy that likes Shakespeare. And he's like, dude, what, what if this guy's Shakespeare? We've identified the rest. And people love that idea. Can you blame him? Can you blame him? Um, so, because of that... That fired off this whole thing, and since then, you know, we've had this kind of giant debate, and even though mainstream academia wants to act like that debate is settled, it's clearly not been. Um, so, the controversy over the attributions no longer debated so hotly, and by the way, this is back in 1980, so we're 43 plus years on here. Um, and she says, recently, Thomas Clayton, who's a scholar like her, has felt it appropriate to place quotation marks in the title of the book the Shakespearean edition of the book of Sir Thomas More. Uh, still matters of attribution have so dominated discussion and have so effectively obscured more important areas of investigation that controversy must be regarded and disposed of before new ground can be broken. As I see it, scholarly commitment to the idea of hand D with Shakespeare ignores what is already known about the operations of playhouses, their owners and writers. So she's mimicking what we were saying in our last video. Like, the way that they're trying to set up the Lord Chamberlain's men where Shakespeare's his main playwright and he's the only guy that's writing solo and everybody else gets to go other places. It's not a consistent um, sort of hypothesis for how things were going back then if you actually just look at these documents. Um, and so because of that, uh, she's going to have to go and tell you who Handy is before we can actually get real useful information about the process of playwrights in here. Um, and so she's going to go on further and um, she explains to us which people started sorry which people started um, giving the attribution and actually trying to give evidence and you know folks like uh, John Dover Wilson are starting to point to bibliographical links so like how stuff's printed and, uh, you know, how stuff's bound. And so it's like the same printers 
are you know maybe involved in this uh, the same um, sort of uh, writing you know setup structure is involved it's like in this. forensic logistics or something yeah <laughs> yeah um, and so it's like that's that's cool stuff but there's not that much bibliographical evidence with this right it's in manuscript form we don't have a bunch of title print pages with printed by Thomas Thorpe or printed by Isaac Jagger we don't have that we don't have any of that um, and then so another thing that's become sort of prominent um, and maybe not become prominent it's always been sort of the thing is the paleographic evidence and uh, not just um, Chillington but maybe more so even Diana Price has sort of gone through and looked at the paleographic evidence and shown you there's nothing here and so let's talk about the paleographic evidence let's look at it so paleography is the study of handwriting um, and uh, back to what Brady said he said forensic um, pathology or forensic investigation um, doing handwriting evidence is one of those things and so um, here you can actually take it to the uh, pictures of the handwriting or oh, to the handy go. okay so these are Shakespeare's signatures let me blow it up for us these are yeah actual copies of Shakespeare's signatures uh, not too informative not very consistent um, the majority of these are late in Shakespeare's life and career. Dare I say infantile looking? Yeah, like. and so they try to say, oh, he's sick and elderly and like, uh, and it's like around when Shakespeare retired, and so um, he's yeah. too sick to write his name correctly, but at some like point... blasted his hand from writing Yeah, th this isn't a man that's like sick with like the flu, or this isn't a man that's like going down with old age. This is a man that has schizophrenia dissociative disorder, because this right here, this one right here, this D, that's a different person than this one. Which is totally a different person from, say, maybe one of these. I don't even know if, if a person wrote this. Like, they probably trained a goat or something. No, I'm kidding. Um, but this is terrible, right? This is not the most literate man uh, to ever live, as, as people want to say Shakespeare is. Um, so, what's... It? You know, even if it is Shakespeare, if, if this is if this is the Stratford man or our playwright, um, it's sure not the same handwriting as this. This is beautiful. This is flowing. Look at that. Look, look, look at these letters. It's gorgeous. This is the actual Sir Thomas More. So this is yeah. the actual Sir Thomas More manuscript. This is the hand deep. This is one of the pages. There's several pages. Uh, but this is one I just want to pull up because it's kind of the best picture. Um, but what on earth? What on earth? You Stratfordians, tell me, please. Don't, you're going to talk about some A that doesn't latch fully. You're going to talk about... Um, no, that, that's probably it. Uh, you, you like your, your not fully latched A. And Shakespeare's the only one that did it with his, you know, invalid, cancer-ridden signatures. But um, <laughs> notice he totally connects the A here. So I don't know. Whoever didn't get the memo here, here... Um, they screwed up, but um, it's absolute garbage that's cherry-picked by a bunch of, dare I say, paid-off paleographers, or just super biased paleographers, or super inept paleographers. I didn't go to school for it. I'll be honest, I didn't. But what on earth would possibly make you say that this is the same handwriting as, oh, sorry, as this? How? How in the world? Let's see, let me, let me pull it here so we can. Is, is it the S shape? Like, no, no, maybe it's, maybe it's the, maybe it's an M or something. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a ridiculous argument. And so, here's the thing. Even if this is the same, the point is that through the science of paleography, through the science of forensic, you know, handwriting analysis, you should not be able to do this identification with certainty or even with any sort of probability. Regardless, you know, like, this is not a big enough sample size for William Shakespeare's handwriting. It's not a consistent sample size at that. Um, and it's conceivably not really recognizably similar to this. So what are they talking about? Um, one of the other arguments is orthography, which is spelling. Um, as I've said, it's not a very strong argument. Uh, we've seen all over, not just here with Henslow, um, not just here with the M Moore manuscript, but talked about with Sydney. Sydney will spell stuff with two L's sometimes, sometimes with a Y, sometimes with an I. 
Um, so like it's it's or Henslow uh, was the one who did that, right? Oh, Henslow does it all yeah. the time. Henslow is like probably dyslexic or something. I don't know. Um, so let's go back to Chillington. Oh, there, oh, there's Price. Up oh, there's no, Tunnel B. Jackson. There we go. All I'm right. Let Brady drive this train for a second. Okay. So, as we see there, I could go through Diana Price piece by piece and show you exactly where she goes through the paleograph, paleographers and what they said about Shakespeare's handwriting. Yeah, she may not cover every paleographer in that essay, but at some point you, you really don't need to. And I don't feel like we actually need to. You have eyes. I have eyes. I, I'm not blind. There's no identification possible. Yeah, that. can we use Occam's, Occam's razor or not? Like, yeah. When, yeah, when is it applicable? When it, when it fits someone's narrative or not? Like, yeah. yeah, so uh, toss that out. So I won't say that it definitively shows that Shakespeare didn't write it. I just want to say that that's absolute, absolutely useless for identification. And uh, please tell me in the comments why I'm wrong. And if, if you're going to just resort to uh, using an authoritative argument that so-and-so said it, uh, please quote them at length why they said it and uh maybe we can have a discussion if it's just the last day you can put that in there but uh, i'm probably not gonna respond <laughs> okay so let's continue on um but no oh, let me uh, gone too far so she says for all that the attribution of shakespeare's had little but venerability to justify it so it's it's you know we love the idea we want that idea to be true and you know, maybe, the, <laughs> maybe there's something to the sentiment that it feels Shakespearean, and Shakespearean just means, like, a great Renaissance play or something, a, a great stirring scene. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, I don't think people are wrong necessarily when they say this feels like Shakespeare. It is Shakespeare. Because, as Brady and I have said, well, Shakespeare is all of these guys, when they're put together and seamlessly edited by, I don't know, someone like Francis Bacon or Ben Johnson or Philip Sidney or something... And when they get seamlessly edited, it's hard to spot them, but you can still spot them if you're looking for it. And you should start looking for it when you see that this is the raw version. That's what this is. This is a raw Shakespeare. If this got fully worked over, it'd be in the folio. If this got fully worked over, we'd just be putting the name Shakespeare. We wouldn't have all those other hand S's and A's and B's and nah, blah. we just call it a Shakespeare because that's what we do. Uh, that's what we've done to a bunch of stuff in the folio, even though we've acknowledged there are co-writers in the folio. We still don't put Shakespeare featuring blah, 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 like you do with like a rap song. Wasn't there someone recently that it was, was it Edward II or one of those plays that for a while they attributed to Shakespeare, but oh, it was Edward III, but now, and it's like, now it's like maybe in the Oxford printings now, I think you said that now they've attributed to... I Thomas Kidd's okay. maybe the more popular one, and that's on the back of Brian Vickers' work, by the way. But like, I think if Brian Vickers and uh, some of these Marlovians team up, you're not just going to see a Marlowe Shakespeare continuum. You're going to see a Marlowe slash kid Shakespeare continuum because it's it's the same kind of alternating group of, of writers. Um, and so Edward III probably has like two of the writers that did Henry VI, but it has two other different writers than, say, Henry VI did. Um, and so it's going to feel similar. Um, and I, I'm just shooting off the spot. I, I'm not fresh enough on... Henry VI, nor uh, Edward III to be, uh, you know, exactly hypothetical about it. But, um, so, what we have with this play is just like a play in the Henslow Diary, and uh, we saw in the Henslow Diary, there's plays like Cardinal Wolsey in there. Um, this may be our Cardinal Wolsey play. Cardinal Wolsey's a prominent figure in the Thomas More story. Um, so, and that one got worked over a bunch, and we see here that this one very literally got worked over a bunch. And we see in the Henslow Diary that Henry Chettle's the first big name popping up with it. And then we see a bunch of other names added to it. And same thing here. We have an original play that gets heavily worked over by Chettle. And then starts to get worked over and more scenes added to it by even other guys. And so it seems like, oh, it's still not working. We've got to do some more to it. It's still this. And so what Carol Chillington's going to tell us here eventually, a little spoiler alert. Um, she's going to tell us that... This is, yeah, maybe it is an early 1590s play, but when all these guys, all these hands that we're identifying, those guys are doing it in the late 90s or early 1600s. And so, um, sure, some of it can be identified as early 90s, and that's why these Stratfordians are going to be able to do that. But it's actually, there's other stuff in it that we can identify. No, this is late 90s or uh, early 1600s, and it's being reworked over. 
And uh, that's totally in line with almost everything we've seen in the Hensler Diary. So, I didn't know this. Just a quick th There's just a little citation here at the bottom of this page. But apparently even our uh, Robert Chambers was talking about uh, stuff and so that's to do not, between Moore it's and Shakespeare. Uh, that's not Yellow King Robert Chambers. It, it says it was. Is it? Yeah, when I looked up R.W. Chambers, it says that it is Robert W. Chambers. I'll be dipped. I guess that is. I'm sorry. I'm so, mixing it up with R.C. Churchill. My bad. So apparently he had ideas about the comparisons between Moore and Shakespeare or whatever, but yeah, weird. I didn't okay, I so <laughs> that's another one that maybe he's not a Shakespeare doubter, but he's into the Shakespeare attribution authorship sort of question, and uh, that's really cool. And uh, I don't know, a lot of you Stratfordians like to think that anybody thinks that someone's not Shakespeare is a, a, a nutto, but uh, you know, what about this guy right above my head? Uh, Mark, maybe the great Mark, American Mark author, Mark just saying, just saying, um, you know, or Walt Whitman, great American poet, but we won't go down that road, just want to bring that back up, um, and yeah, add Robert Chambers to uh, the list, maybe. Okay, so, um, where Chillington goes from here is she says, for all that, the attribution Shakespeare's had little bit venerability justified. Um, Pollard and the others found themselves with a puzzle whose pieces simply would not fit together. Other writers pointed this out. As early as 24, so that's almost 100 years ago, exact. Uh, Levin Schucking, uh, Schucking, oh, sorry, not, not good with my German, challenged the attribution stylistic grounds by listing some 22 words, uh, phrases, and stylistic habits, and more that are just not found in Shakespeare. Um, other discrepancies can be added upon the hip, um, and more phrases and figures metaphorically, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then she goes on further. Um, so there's a lot of these images that you don't really see in Shakespeare, but we do see these images in Hoffman, which is a Henry Chettle play. Um, and so she says, as I intend to suggest later, some relation to more. Other images seem decidedly un-Shakespearean. The sentimental picture of the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, plodding to the ports and costs for transportation. The two stride an injunction to wash your foul minds with tears. Um, the sensational link in a pair of images, either of which alone would probably serve Shakespeare, uh, wetted their detestive knives. And so this person's not just doing a nice Shakespeare. They're, they're going on and on. So, you know, maybe this is Shakespeare, but it's Shakespeare that hasn't been edited and reeled back and said, like, all right, calm down. Because what ends up happening is Shakespeare ends up losing track of the metaphors, losing track of the syntax and waxing so poetic and waxing so metaphorical that... And I say Shakespeare, maybe I should say Handy. That's a, that's a better, uh, more accurate way to say it. Handy starts waxing so imagistic, so poetical, so metaphorical that, like, loses the trees uh, for the forest. And, uh, like, Chillington's pointing it out that, like, Piers inept in other ways. Line 185 becomes entangled in his own syntax. The only elimination, only the elimination of a line can make sense for the next few lines. Um, at about 235, becomes incoherent. So, you know, once again, this can still be Shakespeare, but this is super unedited Shakespeare. And it, if it is Shakespeare, part of the Shakespeare folio and some other writer, the point is that, like, we're seeing it before it's getting heavily worked over. And uh, that makes a difference between what's in the folio and this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, on F, written out by Han C, but attributed to Shakespeare on the same stylistic merits that his claimants defend and assign him Han D's portion... Uh, appears this impenetrable image and let this be thy maxim too great to be great is when the thread of hazard is once spun a bottom great uh, wound up greatly undone and so um, had it been heard shucking's challenge would have been a substantial one but in 24 um, shucking's voice is crying out in the wilderness and so like it's not just like they want to say handy shakespeare but we got some stuff in hand C that sounds like Shakespeare, and so maybe that's why they want to say it's a professional scribe. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. A third challenge to the attribution came in the wake of the attempts to date the play. Ah, dating the play. Uh, could be as late as 15 to not, 1599. Uh, I should regret the date as an obstacle to Shakespeare's authorship of the three pages so great as to almost be fatal. So, some old scholar said, look... This stuff's from 1599. How can it be Shakespeare's? This is all a bunch of Henslow people. Um, it's 1599. Shakespeare's not with Henslow. Sorry, guys. It's probably not Shakespeare. It's somebody just trying to do Shakespeare. 
Um, and then uh, he used Tilney's injunction. Uh, so he said, all right, can't be 1599 then because it's got to be Shakespeare. So he used Tilney's injunction, uh, which was attached to anti-alien riots. So there were riots going on about immigration and that kind of thing. And so he, that was happening in the early 90s. So he's like, all right, that's in this play. Let me date it to 1593, which, you know, not bad. I, I, I get it. Um, Peter Blaney, in the, currently in the process of editing the play, likewise bases a date for the same reason. Um, or for a similar reason, riots by apprentices. But several things are wrong with his date. As Chambers discovered when he compared imagery and more, those parallels are consistently to be found in mature plays. So this is how they date Shakespeare chronology. They're saying this is Shakespeare, but all of a sudden they're not using the same methodologies they've been using. And it's funny once again because they say Shakespeare's mature plays, ones that come later on. Of course, half of these titles are ones that you saw in the Henslow Diary well before all that time period, like from 1591 sometimes or whatever, right? So yeah, Troilus and Crusader for sure by Decker. Uh, Hamlet, the Ur Hamlet that some people have attributed to. Definitely, we saw. How much? Yeah, I think we saw Julius Caesar. We saw Julius Caesar, it. and I didn't bring up Othello, but there's people that think that the Spanish Moors tragedy oh, by right. Decker is uh, that, or maybe it's. Uh, um, there's another title I forget. Um, so yeah, the timelines yeah not looking yeah. good for Stratfordians, regardless. You know, to, to yeah even call them mature plays, but it's like all right, either just stroll the. It just so happens we don't have these dudes' plays to compare to the Shakespeare one, but he but at least uh, at least stole the names that or the name of the title. Right. Like, at best, uh, you know, we may have more evidence otherwise. But yeah, even looking at this, it's not it's not looking good. And and so like it's like all right, all the stuff that's in these plays, which as we've pointed out, are probably uh, Decker Chettle plays and maybe other guys in the Henslow Diary have all the similar features of Sir Thomas More. And so, like, that's a real issue. You can't date this stuff earlier because we don't have the early version of, of Hamlet. And they say Troilus and Cressetta's 1603 or later. And, you know, even the earliest version is 1599 with Decker and Chettle. So, like, how can that be an early one? Uh, Julius Caesar, we saw early versions, but we don't have those. All we have is the later version. And so when they're saying it's similar, they're, they're saying it's similar to the later versions, which are probably worked over. Um, all right, so let's continue. Harrison Chambers pointed out, and this is a different Chambers, this is E.K. Chambers, this is a big time Stratfordian dude, uh, pointed out that vers versific sorry. versification of the three pages would likewise place the writing in the same period of maturity. Moreover, if we look at Tilney's injunction itself for what it expresses topically, we see he's not lodging objections exclusively against riots or even apprentices. Uh, besides Shrewsbury lines, uh, which if you guys haven't read Shrewsbury, he's a trip. Um, 1800s Victorian scholar. Uh, my searching eye did never entertain a more distracted countenance of grief. And then I have late observed in the displeased commons of the city. Tell him to rub tersely. Okay, sorry, it's different Shrewsbury, but also check out Shrewsbury. He's a uh, yeah Victorian uh, scholar. Um, Later, he refused to accept the scene showing Moore's defiance of the crown. Uh, the contents of the articles Moore refused to sign are left discreetly unnamed in the play, but Tilney nevertheless directed the playwrights all alter. He seems to be less nervous about a fray on Pasternoster Row than the kind of sedition that links Dal Williamson's to English Lord Chancellors to include the commons of the city. So he's, he's more worried about social scandals than some sort of uh, public riotous political, you know, sort of thing. Um, so these difficulties led people like Collins and Bald, big scholars, after him uh, to search out a more compelling occasion for Tilney's injunction. They found, and Tilney's injunction is, he's the guy that's editing the play, right? And uh, he's going through the play, and we have his edits. It's like, no, you, you can't do that, guys. You gotta <laughs> nix that. Or, you know, uh, that's okay, but you're gonna have to change some words. Or, uh, nope, this scene's gotta go. It's out. And uh, a lot of that was uh, around the riot scenes, um, and some of that was based on other stuff. And so it's like, you know, I could see the argument sort of both ways for why Tilney's injuncting it, but it could very easily be more around the 1600s and not just these apprentice riots or uh, anti-alien riots of the early 90s. Um, 
They found in the Essex Rebellion of 1601. Ah, Essex Rebellion. Ah. So, if you've listened to me and Brady, we, we mention that, like, every video. Because, like, at the end of the day, like, so much of this Shakespeare group or this Shakespeare solo writer, so much of it, it and I say or for, for y'all's purposes because I don't think for a second that it's just one person. Um, but, like, everything that's from that Essex faction era, the late 90s, early 1600s, you can make so many readings into the Essex faction. And so the fact that somebody from back in the day is making a read in the exit faction, that, that seems very powerful to me. Um, but while they signed to play a date that Pollard objected is almost fatal, neither was willing to relinquish Shakespeare's attribution. So those guys were like, no, it has to be 99, but uh, it's still Shakespeare. We just haven't figured out how. Um, that Shakespeare, who was then fully engaged with Chamberlain's men, would be collaborating as late as 1601 with a group of dramatists regularly employed by the company's resident, Henslow's Rose, was clearly plausible, you know, um, by, by their own standards, by our own, you know, understanding of the whole era. It's not how it works. So what's going on? So conco uh, Collins concocted an explanation of the manuscript's transmission. The play was written by Decker. Haywood and Monday was offered to the Admiral's company at Rose, but objections caused it to be rejected, and it was then given to the Chamberlain's men and Shakespeare, the absolute Johannes factotum, characterized by Pollard, that means, you know, um, guy that thinks he's got, got all the stuff, um, characterized by Pollard, was called in to salvage the play by touching up one scene, the insurrection. But if Shakespeare's job was to make more actually playable, then he royally failed. Because uh, he spent all his time enhancing objectionable material, you know, stuff that <laughs> Tilney had already said, no, you, we're not doing this. Like, that's the stuff that Shakespeare kept writing. So if, if your whole thing is that Shakespeare got in charge of it to fix it, the opposite happened. Um, so it brings her to her main argument. All the theories so far have ignored the one area of investigation that can make sense of the play. They have failed to see Thomas More as one of the hundreds of plays turned out by a theatrical industry whose habits and operations point to a much different explanation of its origin. And that's where we get into the next group. Okay. Um, so she says, this document I can explain in practical terms how a play such as Sir Thomas More can be written. For example, the accounts reveal the relentless demands placed upon playwrights by playing the company's working relationships. Likewise, they reveal plainly uh, that for the playhouse owner, player, and playwright alike, the theater was first and foremost an economic venture. Um, let me skip forward. And so she says, playwrights had to turn out the work with astonishing speed. So that may explain why this play isn't that great. Like, go read Sir Thomas More. It's not that great. Handy is kind of cool. Um, and, you know, there's maybe some funny Decker parts. Not really. Um, it's, it's just hitting beat points. It's, it's not fully filled out. It's not that great. And that totally makes sense. The Henslow stuff, they're, they're, boom, pumping it out. Like, go read the one printing of Sir John Oldcastle that you can. It's, it's not as good as Henry IV. Any, any of them, part one, part two, or Henry V. It's not as good. Um, but that stuff's getting pumped out. And like I said, even though I think the Shakespeare folio is a lot of original stuff is being played by Henslow or written by the guys that are with Henslow for other companies, um, they're still getting reworked over before the folio. And they're getting reworked over as they're being shown. Um, and some of those are already reworking overs of earlier plays. So, um, let's see. Let's continue. Uh, some sense of pressure under which the dramatist's work is conveyed by Henslow's diary. Henslow noted that he had paid under Mr. Drayton Mr. Decker's full payment of a book called Hannibal and Hermes, and that at the same time he had lit under Mr. Decker's an additional sum upon the next book called Pierce of Winchester. Two weeks later, Pierce was finished. So, he's like telling Decker, I need you to write this play. Oh, by the way, you can also write this play. Two weeks later, he's already got that other one. Just Alright, here, here you go. Um, production schedules make it unlikely that playwrights devoted much time to individual plays. Indeed, Henslow's accounts show plays normally being completed in four to six weeks. Um, thus, Henslow paid Chettle, Decker, Haywood, Smith, and Webster 50 shillings in earnest of Lady Jane. One week later, he paid them in full. And so she's going to connect this back. Um, earlier payments record uh, records provide the same information. 
A number of other recorded payments show that the rapidity of composition was habitual rather than exceptional. Um, as Henslow's record shows, plays were usually written piecemeal, and it seems to have been the company's habit to allow writers partial payments in sections. Sometimes only a plot were delivered. Um, going onwards. So the pattern of Henslow's payment distribution suggests that the work by collaborators could be divided unequally. Uh, what's most conspicuous in all these records is the prominence of economics in Henslow's Playhouse. Uh, we are in contact with journeymen who were playwrights as other men were wheelwrights or shipwrights. The poet's commitment to the financial success of their plays, it appears, and not to any notion of art's timeless monuments. Um, and once again, I think that's probably true and that stuff is getting reworked over for publication. So when, when you get stuff that's real pretty and artful, it's, yeah, it's for publication because these people are going to have to touch it more and more. And maybe that's when you start to get the crazy John D. esotericism and the, the bacon codes and all that. I don't know that that's actually that important for a spoken play. It's way more important for the actual written word where you <coughs> look at the codes and decode them. Uh -uh. All right, um, going farther. Playwrights did spend time revising plays, but only under circum uh, certain circumstances. So we don't find the case assumed about Sir Thomas More of an unacted play being revised months or years after it was written. Um, if the diary is to be believed, only Chettle's orphan tragedy remains in progress very long. Uh, the modesty of payments probably indicates the modesty of achievement, blah, blah, blah. Um, let me go on further. Okay, so revivals called for revisions. Uh, Decker was mending the old play Tasso. Um, yeah, we go. Henslow's payments tend to support the notion that some sort of etiquette prevailed among revisers for nearly every case one of the original writers was called to make the additions. Which is interesting, noting that Ben Johnson, in that last one I showed, is revising Richard, Richard Crookback in Geronimo. When, isn't that supposed to be kid? Ben Johnson's not old enough to write Geronimo. But, um, maybe that's, you know, uh, that's an exception. You know, Chillington's not saying that that's what actually happened. I'm not going to put those words in her mouth. Um, that's an exception, but maybe it's not. Maybe Ben Johnson's one of those original writers, and Ben Johnson's not Ben Johnson. Who knows? Um, and okay. for the layperson, Old Castle is also a reference, essentially, to the character Falstaff, in case, you know, right, right. anybody who's still sort of new to consuming any of this stuff. But. Uh, allocations for costumes may reveal something about prompting, promptness for licenses. Um, we see a bunch of stuff bought for Cardinal Wolsey. It's unlikely they would have spent this money if it's not shown. Um, so, finally, his records demonstrate that competition among rival companies was fierce. Um, not only were Hensel's receipts affected by new construction projects, um, given what he knows about the repertoire of Shakespeare's company, we might see in his list of plays a fair amount of interest in what was happening. I think that's Chillington sort of missing that point, but she has the right observation here. A bunch of stuff in Henslow is the same as what's happened to Lord Chamberlain's. Um, but it's, it's not just they're writing similar stuff. I think that we have, you know, sort of the same group of writers or that that play is getting passed over to a similar group of writers that's writing it for a different company. Um, We'd like to note that at the top of the page, there is a mention of a play called Black Batman. I have, I don't, do we have copies of that or no? no. Okay, so we don't. So yeah, too bad, uh. Uh, what's the what's the guy who wrote uh, Bob? I can't remember the guy who wrote Batman or whatever. But yeah, oh, okay, we, yeah, yeah. yeah, we might have some we might have some litigation here. But. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Batman may not be an original DC comic. That may go back to Chettle and Decker. Uh, Black Batman of the North. Uh, I wish I knew what that was about. Super super gnarly title. Okay, but I want to skip forward here to where she starts talking about John Webster. Uh, so, my bad, I remember it as being earlier in the essay, but it is actually later in the essay. But, so, she's talking about the habits of Chettle and Decker, and she's pointing out that, like, look, these guys are doing other stuff, and, uh, so they can't write everything, so you do have to piecemeal it out, and you have to get people to write scenes that they're good at, and so Decker does some comedy scenes, some domestic comedy scenes, and um, Handy, whether it's Shakespeare or some other person, is doing these kind of political big speech scenes and uh so like it makes sense that it's getting pieced out to people that are good at different things and uh through it she sort of cross compares that 
look, we can sort of figure out that this is probably being concurrently written exactly when the stylistic evidence shows, and we can like almost literally fit it in by saying, here's a gap in what Decker's writing. We have a bunch of Decker did this, Decker did this, Decker did this, then we don't have anything. And then we have Decker did this, Decker did this. Maybe that blank is exactly when Decker's working on this if it's not the Cardinal Wolsey play. Um, okay, so she finally gets to um, Webster. I do not intend to defend Webster's authorship of the three pages with any of the cunning or vehemence that marks the defense of Shakespeare's. She's, she's like, I don't know for certain that it's Webster, but she wants to throw it in because she thinks it's just as legitimate or better than Shakespeare. Um, so... The metrics of the three pages uh, fail to suggest young Shakespeare. So, furthermore, like remember, if, if this is Shakespeare, this has to be early Shakespeare. This cannot be later Shakespeare. This has to be early Shakespeare. And the metrics don't line up. Okay, metrics meaning like the rhythm and uh, beats to the poem. So, like, you know, is it going for nine syllables or ten syllables line? Is it going for eleven syllables? Are we getting almost all iams are we getting some inversions are we getting um you know different weird accents on words to fit metrics or not that's how you can sort of try to identify authors um so it doesn't really line up with early shakespeare like henry the sixth stuff like that um but in their high incidence of feminine endings and in their high proportion of resolved feet considerably higher elsewhere in the manuscript they do suggest a young Webster. Okay, interesting. And so, um, feminine endings is like having 11 syllables rather than 10, so it's not the perfect I am pentameter, it's like an extra syllable. Um, let's see. Resolved feet. Oh, I'm gonna have to look that one up, guys. Sorry about that. Um, but she's saying, look, this looks a lot like young Webster. And, um, young Webster's in the Henslow Diary, and uh, a more mature Webster is like Duchess of Malfi, White Devil, that's like peak Webster. If you've never read Webster, go read those two plays. They're just as good as any Shakespearean tragedy, eh, for the most part, you know? Um, and they're cool because they more prominently feature female characters. So with uh, Shakespeare, the only really great female leads are always in comedies. Uh, Webster like takes those kind of Shakespearean female leads. It's like, all right, you get to be Hamlet now. We get a female Hamlet. So... I'm kind of surprised John Webster hasn't had a big rejuvenation with, you know, the rise of feminism, with the rise of more leftist PC ideas, um, more representative ideas. Like, you know, John Webster's really an early feminist in a lot of ways, whether John Webster is a guy, a girl, or, you know, actually John Webster is some pen name for it. It doesn't matter. Like, it's in the text. And um, so, yeah, go, go read John Webster. That's my point. <laughs> Okay. Theories to come about John Webster, you know, for anyone who wants to, you know, make a little note here and try to be like, oh, that's what the, oh, interesting connection, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Um, and so they also share habits of style, the most prominent of which is the rhetorical manipulation of repetition. Uh, so, you know, saying kind of the same structure over and over, using the same word over and over. Not only of words and phrases, but of syntactical construction. There you go. Highly conscious use of this device is what sets... Handy's contribution apart from the rest of more manuscript. Like, yeah, there, there's some more kind of cool rhetorical, actual, like, thoughtful stuff happening rather than just plot, plot dump and dialogue. Um, we might, for example, observe how the word peace reverberates through more speech, its meaning shifting from denotative to connotative and finally coming to rest in metaphor for his main theme, obedience. So it's like, yeah, peace starts out as this real thing, and then it's sort of like, you know, it can mean a lot of things, and then by the end, it's, it's like a loose symbol for another idea altogether. Um, Webster does that. Let's see. And I would also argue Shakespeare does that, but the, her point is that, yeah, Webster does that, so why is he not an option? Um, verbs are repeated. Uh, grant them removed and uh, grant would shark would feed noun clauses are piled on top of each other you would taught how insolence and strong hands should prevail how order should be quelled verb phrases wet their detested knives spurn you like dogs the full vigor of this rhetoric is marshaled into remorseless challenges what it is you have got although we grant you get the thing you seek what had you got i'll tell you and the writing has a quality of urgency increased by these compulsive use of conjunctions um, 
So each uh, blah 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 expression of this rhetorical power can be seen in Sir Thomas Wyatt. That's a Decker and Webster play. Uh, as is, you know, Lady Jane. You should uh, check those out. They're pretty good. Uh, here Webster concentrates with repetition with a difference to energize a fast-moving scene in which Mary Tudor accepts her crown. Um, and he will bear no office in the land, and yet will marry the queen of all, nor be of counsel in the realm's affairs, and yet the queen enclosed his arms, in, in his arms. So lots of conjunctions. We get the re repetition. We get this sort of um, verbal construction. Will, will, uh, be. Uh, and so we have future, future, and then we got uh, infinitive, and then we got past tense. And so it's this kind of rhetorical structure saying what will happen to what has already happened. Um, let's see, conjunctions are used everywhere. The imagery of the three pages bears resemblance to Webster's imagery elsewhere. Webster holds no monopoly on images of disease, yet it accords with his habits of mind. Accursed strangers and Sir Thomas More should be accused of infecting the city with palsy. So yeah, Webster likes dark kind of, you know, gro grotesque, macabre, yeah, macabre. Yeah. Uh, you see that in the small little bit here. You know, before we go further, let's just read a little bit. Let's just read a little bit uh, of the actual play. Oh, let's see if I can find it. Okay, I've skipped ahead to one of Sir Thomas More's famous lines in here, and this is like handy. This is handy. Um, this is probably the famous section, so she was literally quoting this. Grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, and their poor luggage plodding to the ports and costs for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you. You had taught how insolence and strong hands should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern not one of you should live in an age and man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with self-same hands, self-reason, self-right, would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. Before God, that's as true as the gospel. Nay, this is a sound fellow, I tell you. Let's mark him. You yeah. know, sounds pretty Shakespearean. Let me set up before your thoughts, good friends, on supposition, which if you will mark, you shall perceive how horrible a shape your innovation bears. First is a scene which oft the apostle did forewarn us of, urging obedience to authority, and twere no error if I told you all you were in arms against your God himself. Mary, God forbid that! Nay, certainly you are, for to the king God hath his often... Uh, nay, certainly you are, for to the king God hath his office lent of dread, of justice, power, and command, hath bid him rule and willed you to obey, and to add ampler majesty to this. He hath not only lent the king his figure, his throne and sword, but given him his own name, calls him a god on earth. What do you then, rising against him that God himself installs, but rise against God? What do you two, your souls, in doing this? O oh, desperate as you are, wash your foul minds with tears in those same hands that you, like rebels, lift against the peace, lift up for peace your unreverent knees. Make them your feet to kneel to be forgiven. Tell me but this. What rebel captain, as mutinies are incident, by his name can still the rout? Who will obey a traitor? How, or how can well that proclaim? Proclamation sound when there is no addition but a rebel to qualify a rebel. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law and line to slip them like a hound. Uh, let slip uh, the dogs, uh, you know, and cry havoc. Uh, Julius Caesar, uh, is that Mark Antony, I think, says that. Uh, that's Shakespeare. That's what people point to. But as Brady and I will point to, no, that's John Webster writing it in the Henslow Diary. It's in there. John Webster wrote that. These are John Webster lines. Um, that gets counted as Shakespeare in the folio, but there, there's a deeper understanding than just say it's Shakespeare. So anybody wants to say Shakespeare, you got it. Anybody wants to say it's Webster, you got it. It's, you're both right, because Webster is part of Shakespeare. You, are you all starting to see how this works? Um, okay. Say now the king, as he is clement, if the offender mourn, should so much come to short of your great trespasses but to banish you, whether would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, oh, scroll too fast, thank you, should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province or to Spain or Portugal. Pause, pause real quick. 
we said that Philip Sidney had to, you know, go to a lot of places. Uh, some of those are kind of same places. And uh, we also mentioned that Philip Sidney may have had to hide out in a continental tour of Europe if he faked his death and was acting as Samuel Daniel and writing, you know, as people like Abraham France or maybe even Robert Greene or Thomas Kidd or Chris Marlowe or something like that. And he's writing from over on the continent and sending it over. Uh, he'd know about lines like this. Go you to France or Flanders. Uh, wait, wait. Where was it Philip Sidney died? Where, where was it? Pray tell. In the Netherlands? Yeah, it was Flanders. It was Flanders. So, yeah, here we go, folks. All right. So, any of you guys not looking for Sidney, start looking. And uh, I also, yeah, another little drop. I did like how, if you saw that one line, uh, Mary, God forbid. Uh, yeah, just another little shout out yep. on, in relation to this. Yep. Yeah, another, and a little nugget for later yeah, on. Yeah, this maybe could be Mary Sidney or Mary Ann Philip. Um, Nay, anywhere that not adheres to England, why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth? Wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owed not nor made not you, nor that the claimants were not all appropriate to your comforts, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? Which, by the way, if this actually got played, good luck to the actor doing these lines. Holy smokes. Like, I, I had trouble reading it. Like, I couldn't breathe. Like, th this is crazy. This is like one, one long sentence that goes through a lot of emotions and a lot of images and re goes through images that were there earlier, re goes through emotions that were there earlier. And like, remember, this is a guy talking to the, like, rabble. And so it's like, you know, th this is some pretty heavy syntax for some guy trying to get the rabble. But at some point, maybe this is the point that like, if you just whip out your rhetoric over people, they don't understand stuff. And how ironic here, um, g given the context of what we're doing. Um, but yeah, the, the rhetoric's so, so thick and... It's kind of inflammatory. Yeah. yeah. And like, so once again, if this is the guy that's supposed to be getting hired to fix the play's, like, political issues, like, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's dumping calling, gasoline yeah, on a fire. Real, yeah, calling out the king, calling out to, like... Calling uh, out God, like... Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is the stranger's case and this is your mountainous humanity and this is also interesting this is somebody like super defending the immigrants and so this is taking a politicized stand on like if this is part of that early 90s thing like they want to say like uh, this is someone taking a super politicized stand uh, against people being against the immigration this is somebody trying to build an ethical argument for these immigrants which is interesting given the context and so like you know we're, we're accused often of being elitist since we think that aristocrats may have possibly had hands in the Shakespeare and other you know writers of the, the era um, and you know this is a section where the writer seems to have some proletariat sort of you know leanings and um, I don't think that it's crazy to think an aristocrat could have that especially someone you know, just, just throwing it out there. Someone like Philip Sidney that got to be an aristocrat, albeit a very junior, to quote some Stratfordians, a very junior aristocrat. Um, but if he faked his death and came back and is being Samuel Daniel, he doesn't get to be an aristocrat anymore. Maybe around Mary, if, you know, if it's even that open. Um, but otherwise, there's some guy that has to now just be the regular pro proletariat. And nobody would have a better understanding of how to get stepped on coming from the aristocrat to the proletariat. You get it. You get to see both sides. Uh, so just throwing that out there. And if Philip is going through this experience, Mary's seeing it too, and maybe some of these other writers are. Maybe that's what opens the door for people to start, you know, having these pseudo-identities and pen names and maybe more people faking deaths and stuff is seeing how this works and saying, hey, I can do it. Okay. Um, let's see. More keeps going, and uh, we could read more of more. Um... But I just wanted to give you guys an idea. Um, and so I won't go too much further. I think we can probably close this video out here. Um, but we see that she's got some good reasons for suggesting Webster. We see that there's good reasons for saying that the Shakespeare attribution for the you know Stratford man certainly is handy, is <laughs> well, silly at best. Um, and so just want you to keep your mind open and start to see that maybe we have a whole picture going here if you start to cross-examine between this document 
in the Henslow Diary. Yeah, I do like how she actually does use the Henslow Diary to like, you know, hey, I'm trying to like take a, a, a real, you know, look at this time period and like here's what we have to go on or whatnot. And so, yeah, really providing that really all over encompassing view uh, of things, which is what you would think a real historiography sort of like, you know, endeavor should actually entail, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, we'll close it out. I totally recommend going and reading this essay. Once again, it's uh, Carol Chillington's... Let me get back to the home page so I don't misquote the title. Playwrights at Work. Henslow, Not Shakespeare's Book of Sir Thomas More from 1980. Uh, you may have to do a little bit of searching. Google don't like you to find it. I think that's interesting. Um, and you said that she was on the wiki page for the Sir yeah, Thomas she, she More. Yeah, she used but to be on all... the wiki page, and it used to mention John Webster. It's not there anymore. I may try and put it back on there. Um, but yeah, you have to search for it. But uh, if you can't find it, uh, look into JSTOR. Uh, it's, it's on here. Um, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you guys maybe try and look into this reading that we can find the Henslow writers in the Shakespeare folio. Um, we're going to keep going down this road, but we may take a quick little side stop uh, in our next video because we want to start talking about the sonnets as well. Uh, it's not just the plays that are important for attribution or authorship question. Um, the sonnets as well. Like Plenty of people have gone through the sonnets and said, whoa, these don't all seem to be written by the same person. And uh, we want to kind of look into that. So we may uh, be going down that road very soon, uh, but we will continue going down this road as well, um, looking at the plays. We want to start showing some more Decker, some more Webster, uh, some more Johnson, some more Chettle, uh, some more Drayton. Uh, you know, some of these guys, we don't have as much of their plays. We have some poetry. Some of these guys, we have essays. Some of these guys, we have tons of plays. Like Decker, we do have tons of plays. Um, so we're going to start looking at those. And if you're not reading those, go start reading those. If you're not reading those, you're not going to be able to make an accurate, you know, sort of understanding of this era. You're going to be dealing with Shakespeare in isolation. And that's not going to be a very good way of getting a grasp of what's happening. And that's been one of our arguments from the beginning, too, is sort of saying... Uh, yeah, are some of these plays Shakespeare worthy or Shakespeare quality, right? And just being like, wow, this, wow, this, this, like you said, this really could be part of that canon or whatnot, right? Not just in like you know imagery, but like you know in syntax and all that stuff too. But uh, yeah, what what makes something worthy? What, what who's getting to set the bar of what's good plays and whatnot, right? Right, uh, and then not even across Shakespeare, it's not even quite you know uniform, right? Right, and uh, as we go down that road, we may show you some of the scholarship on Shakespeare and other playwrights from like say the 17 1800s because that does sort of explain why we got Shakespeare in isolation um, a lot of other ones kind of got snubbed uh, people that were maybe seen as equals with Shakespeare were eventually put aside for maybe sort of outdated reasons and so it might be time to pull these people back out and say yeah they're as good as Shakespeare let's start reading them again okay Thanks for watching, guys. I hope y'all keep tuned in. Give me comments. Um, you know, if, if you are a Stratfordian, tell us why we're wrong. If you're an Oxfordian, tell us, you know, how we can find more Oxford. If you're a Baconian, uh, you know, tell us why those other two people are wrong and what we need to look for. And if you're just an agnostic, you know, tell us what you liked about this video and the other videos and uh, keep tuning in. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks so much. We'll y'all have a good time. one.